Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another Adventure in Pure Mathematics. In this video, I want to tell you about the Riemann Rock Theorem in its, in it, its original form, which was for uh, smooth projective curves. Uh, this uh, theorem is probably the best general formula for studying the Riemann Rock space of a divisor on a curve. And it's always the first port of call that an algebraic geometer uses to, for studying uh, that to read my rock space. Okay, so let's set up our notation. Uh, first to here, x will be a smooth projective curve over our algebraically closed field k. Uh, one of the things that that means, of course, is that if you look at the structure chief of um, uh, x, o, x, and you look at the global sections, that's just equal to k. Okay, so the only regular functions which are globally defined on this projective curve is going to be k. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why we like projectivity here. It makes all these uh, spaces of global sections and even the cohomologies, they're all finite dimensional by say finiteness. And in this case here, it's actually just equal to uh, k. The next thing that we do need is the canonical sheaf omega x, and I'll introduce some more uh, terminology and notation. Uh, we want uh, big K to be the canonical divisor. So what's that? Uh, so remember that whenever you have an invertible sheaf like uh, omega x here, uh, it can be embedded as a sheaf of uh, rational functions, okay, and uh, it'll be an invertible subsheaf, and associated to that is a divisor, okay. You can do that in lots of different ways. Any such divisor, k, so oxk, that's isomorphic to this omega x, is called a canonical divisor. So this is only defined up to linear equivalence, this k, but this is fairly standard sort of terminology and notation. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we'll consider some uh, coherent sheaf f, okay, uh, later we'll restrict to uh, invertible sheaves, but let's uh, look at uh, uh, the general notation, okay, so if we have some coherent sheaf f, uh, remember the Euler characteristic, chi of f is just little h0 of f minus little h1 of f. So this, these uh, little h's, remember, are just the dimensions of the big h's, okay? So uh, the dimension of the uh, space of global sections here and the dimension of the first cohomology space here. Okay, and so uh, the reason why we're going to look at the Euler characteristic is it turns out that even though maybe most of the time you're just interested in this h0, the best formulae uh, that you can get usually are, are stated in terms of the Euler characteristic. You can only get really nice formulae um, involving this Euler characteristic. And why is that the case? Let me just remind you this very, very important property of the Euler characteristic. If you have some short exact sequence of coherent sheaves, say from 0 to f prime to f to f double prime, uh, then the Euler characteristics of these are rela related in a very simple way. This is uh, essentially just additivity of the Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic of the middle term, chi of f, is just the sum of the Euler characteristics of the outside terms, chi of f prime plus chi of f double prime. And that's the formula that we're going to use uh, to prove the riemann roch theorem. And it's generally a very, very important uh, 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 and useful fact to use in algebraic geometry. Something else that's involved in the riemann roch theorem is say duality. So let me just uh, remind you what that involves in the case of an invertible sheaf L. Okay, so basically there's a duality uh, between a first cohomology class and a, uh, or rather a first cohomology space and a home space. So what's that? So if you look at the first cohomology space H1 of L and look at the vector space due of that, that's uh, isomorphic to the homs from L to omega x. Okay, so these are dual vector spaces, H1 of L and hom L to omega x. Uh, in the case where L is invertible, so this holds true actually even if L is any uh, coherent sheaf here, but the reason why I want to look at an invertible sheaf is that when this is invertible, we can rephrase this as an H0. That's going to be useful for us. So remember, uh, L is an invertible sheaf. Uh, uh, the dual sheaf, L star, is going to be the inverse. When you tensor by L star, uh, that's going to be a category equivalent. So that will give you an isomorphic HOM. So this is the same as the HOMs of if you tensor with L star, you get O here. If you tensor with L star, you get L star tensor omega x. And homs from O into something like this is just H0. So at the end of the day, uh, the dual of this H1 of this uh, invertible sheaf L is isomorphic to an H0. And which H0 is that? So you need this duality. So you have to dual this L. And also there's this uh, involvement of this uh, canonical sheaf. Uh, which is also called the dualizing sheaf for this reason. Okay, so L star tends to omega x. 
Okay, now we're ready to state the riemann roch theorem, and I'll do it for divisors. That's probably the easiest uh, way to do it. So let D be a divisor on X, okay? And we're interested in global sections O of D. So um, the, the way that it's usually stated is using uh, not just H0 O of D, okay? Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll look at H0 O of D, and we're going to subtract another H0, but of a different divisor, this time uh, O of K minus D. Okay, so uh, why, where does this come from? Okay, so if you look at this O of K minus D, what does it sort of correspond to? If you look at this uh, here, okay, uh, if L is O of D, L is O of D, then uh, this K minus D corresponds to what? Well, K corresponds to omega X, and minus d corresponds to L star. So basically, this H0 here is uh, essentially uh, this term for L equals O of D. So that means that we can uh, go over here, uh, use this isomorphism to say that this is just a dual of H1 of O of D. And so the dimension of the dual space, of course, the same as the dimension of the original space. So this is just basically H1 of O of D. Okay, so this term here by say duality essentially is just H1 of O of D. So this is just H0 minus H1, so this is just chi of O of D. So this first part is just say duality. The next part is the heart of the riemann roch theorem, okay, and that is how do you compute the Euler characteristic of an invertible shape like O of D? It should be a function of D, and in fact it's a very simple function of D. It's the following. You just take chi of O, and you just add the degree of D. That's all you need to do. Okay, so this is the part that I'll prove later. Uh, usually the theorem is not written like this. The, usually the theorem is written um, by expressing precisely what is chi of O. And what is chi of O? Well, this is H0 minus H1. H0 of O, remember H0, big H0 of OX is just K, so the dimension is just 1. And then you have to subtract off um, H1 of O. And H1 of O is something by definition is called the, ge uh, the geometric genus of this X. So 1 minus g here, that's the Euler characteristic of O, and then you add in the degree of D. So the usual way the riemann roch theorem is stated is little h0 of O of D minus little h0 of O k minus D is equal to 1 minus g plus degree of D. Okay, so um, just some comments about uh, what's involved here. Okay, so the thing that you want to do, it's not precise information, it doesn't just compute H0 of O of D for you automatically. It's only a relationship between this one and H0 of O K minus D. Nevertheless, even though uh, this is all the information that you get, okay, it's still very useful. Okay? Often, uh, there'll be a reason why you can compute one of them, and since you can compute one of them, you can compute the other. So uh, just to give you an example of the a taste of that sort of thing, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the degree of uh, the canonical sheet omega x. And it's going to be equal to just 2 times the geometric genus minus 2. And the proof of this is easy enough. Okay? So what we'll do is we're going to look at the riemann roch theorem in the case that d equals k. So here we'll have a h0 of k. And if you put d equals k here, you'll get 0. So that's h0 of o minus h0 of o. And that equals, on the right-hand side, equals 1 minus uh, the geometric genus plus the degree of k. So let's look at all these terms. So h0 of O, remember the global sections here is just k, so that equals 1. h0 of O of k, so this is going to be, um, uh, by say a duality, okay, the global sections of this, is equal to h1 of O. So that equals g the geometric genus. And finally, the degree of k, remember k is just giving us the canonical shift. So the degree of omega x is, by definition, just the degree of k. So that's the degree of omega x. So now we can solve for the degree of omega x. We put the g to the other side to get you 2g. And we put the 1 to the other side. There's a, a minus here, so it's minus this one. And then we subtract that other one, so it's minus 2. So that's rather nice, is that um, here, all right, I guess the key point is that H0 of O we define to be G, and the G occurs in this formula anyway. Okay, so we know that one, so that means that we can uh, compute 
the degree of, in this case, this is the unknown term actually, okay, degree of omega x, okay, so the degree of k. And we've got a wonderful formula for that. And remember that if you use uh, CA duality, uh, this will allow us to uh, give uh, vanishing theorems for first cohomology. Okay. So, um, yeah, as I said, this riemann roch theorem, uh, the usual way that we use it is it gives you a relationship between two um, riemann roch essentially riemann roch spaces, the dimensions of them, okay? And if you know about something about one of them, okay, or a little bit about both of them, sometimes you get more information using this equation. Okay, so let's now prove this theorem. And the theorem, the only thing that's missing here is this middle equation here. The chi of O of D, that's a function of D. And what is the function of D? Well, basically, it's a simple linear function of the degree of D. Okay, it's the degree of D plus chi of O. Okay, so up to this uh, constant here, which is 1 minus G. Okay, it's just the degree of D. So the way you can do this is, firstly, you can check to see what happens when D equals uh, uh, 0. Okay, if D equals 0, the degree of D is 0. Then chi of uh, O is uh, then this is chi of O, um, and this is chi of O, so the quality holds. So since uh, this divisor is just an integer linear combination of um, points, you can get this divisor uh, recursively just by adding and subtracting points. Okay, and so by backward and uh, forward induction, uh, you just need to prove the following lemma. Okay. If you're given any point P, okay, if you want to look at chi of O D plus P, it equals chi of O D plus 1. Okay. So in other words, if you increase uh, the degree of this divisor uh, D by, uh, by 1 by, in this fashion by adding a single point, okay, then in this particular case here, we know that uh, the change in this chi is by adding 1, and that's consistent with what we have here. Okay. And then if we have this fact, then using induction, we'd be able to prove this formula. Okay, so that's the plan. Okay, so how are we going to do that? So what we're going to do now, and this is the thing that's kind of interesting and something that's very important uh, about how um, uh, Grodin Dick introduced uh, coherent sheaves, uh, 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 and one of the reasons why uh, the, the study of sheaves is important uh, is the following reason. So it may be that uh, in many ways we're interested in divisors in uh, algebraic geometry. Uh, however, the thing is that uh, uh, you may think that with these devices, you only care about the corresponding invertible sheaves. Uh, but sometimes you want to play around with these invertible sheaves, then you have to look at other uh, sheaves as well. And this is an example where this occurs. Okay. So uh, here we're going to look at the invertible sheaves O, the structure sheaf, okay, the, uh, the sheaf of regular functions on X. And also the ideal sheaf um, of functions which are 0 at P. Okay, and that's O minus P. And then we have a short exact sequence. We can take the, this is of course a, a subsheaf of this, and the quotient is going to be the structure sheaf on P, which is also the skyscraper sheaf at P, okay, OP. And it's important that we uh, use this uh, sheaf here, which is a torsion sheaf, okay? So that's part of the theory, okay? And the first thing that we need to know is that when we take this torsion uh, uh, sheaf here, okay, since it's a torsion sheaf uh, on this, um, uh, on this curve, so in other words, it's supported at points. If you tensor by any line bundle, it's, uh, it's still isomorphic to itself. It doesn't change up to isomorphism at least. Okay, so uh, in particular, if you take this OP and you tensor with this uh, line, uh, invertible sheaf, OD plus P, it's still isomorphic to OP. And why is that true? Um, so suppose here now, this is your curve X, okay? So what is this OP? Well, it's supported at this point, okay? And what is this uh, line, uh, this invertible sheaf here? So in some neighborhood of this point, maybe this neighborhood here, remember since it's an invertible sheaf, it has to be locally free. So it's going to be free in some affine neighborhood, open affine neighborhood of P, and rank 1. So basically, it's just equal to OX, the ring itself, OK, uh, in some affine open neighborhood of uh, this P. And of course, when you tensor by the ring itself, Okay, uh, it uh, leaves this uh, module the same. Okay, it's still isomorphic to itself. Okay, so on here, there's no change. What about outside this uh, this uh, affine set? Okay, so if you're away from P, this is going to be zero. So it doesn't matter what you tensor with on uh, outside of P, 
you'll always get zero, so it's isomorphic outside of P as well. So that tells you that, yes, you always have this isomorphism like that. Okay, so uh, let's see what we're going to do. We're going to take this short exact sequence, and we're going to tensor with the invertible sheaf O D plus P. So there's our short exact sequence. Start here. That will tensor with O D plus P. The O minus P, when you tensor with O D uh, plus P, remember it's uh, this is a group homomorphism from uh, divisors to invertible sheaves uh, with a tensor product. So you just add D plus P to that to get your T, uh, D. This O becomes O D plus P. And as I mentioned before, when you tensor this with an invertible sheaf, it's still isomorphic to itself, so you get O P. So here you have a short exact sequence. And now we notice that uh, in the lemma that we want to prove, we want to look at OD plus P and OD. Both these occur in this short exact sequence. So we can use this fact that the Euler characteristic is additive to relate the two. So the Euler characteristic of the middle term, chi of OD plus P, is the sum of the Euler characteristics of the outside terms. It's chi of OD plus chi of OP. So this looks, looks like exactly the same as the lemma that we want to prove, the formula. We just need to show that this chi of OP is equal to 1, and then we'll be done. And that's quite easy to do. Let me show you how that works. So we're calculating this chi of OP, which by definition, the Euler characteristic is just H0 minus H1. So it's H0 of OP minus H1 of OP. Now remember, OP is a torsion sheaf on this curve. So uh, big H1 vanishes, and in particular little H1 also vanishes. So you're just looking at H0 of OP. So the global sections of this OP is equal to this. And um, this you can compute uh, in a couple of different ways, okay, uh, to be one. I guess probably the easiest is just to notice that, uh, well, what is this? Uh, so, so let me do it two ways. Uh, one way to think about this is to just say, uh, okay, um, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, sheaf here, OP. This sheaf is, well, on any open set, right, uh, it's a sheaf, so on any open set there's some space of sections. So that space of sections is going to be uh, 0 if the uh, open set doesn't contain P, and it'll be uh, K if it does contain P. So that's why, uh, since the P is, if, if you look at the global sections, you're looking at the open set X, which does contain P, so it's going to be uh, the, uh, the dimension of um, the global sections, and so that's going to be the dimension of k, which is 1. Uh, another way to do it, you can compute it from the affine covers if you like. Okay, if you compute it with the affine covers, you write x as a union of u0 and u1, with p in the intersection. Uh, you can assume this by moving the covers if you like, um, or, or you can do a separate uh, case where p is not inside uh, one of these uh, if you like, but it has to be in one of them. Okay. And if you do it that way, you can compute this using the sheaf property. Okay, so what is this? So this is going to be, you look at OP of U0, uh, direct some OP of U1, with the global sections on these affine open sets. Okay, and basically uh, the uh, global sections is going to be the kernel of, take the direct sum of these, and you just uh, map it to the intersection. Okay, and in this case, uh, what you have here, since P is contained inside U0 and U1, and also the intersection, these three are just K. And of course, uh, these are just the identity maps from this K to this K, and this K to this K, or maybe you want to uh, negate one of them. Um, I guess uh, yeah, you should negate it, so the map is basically 1 minus 1. And then you can compute the kernel, but essentially you've got a subjective map, right? So this is a subjective map from two dimensional to one dimensional vector space, so that has to be one dimensional vector space, so it's K. So that gives you that the H0 is going to be one. But either way, uh, you compute it, okay, however you like. The main thing is that chi of OP is equal to one, and that gives us this formula, and hence the riemann roch theorem. Okay, so this is a wonderful formula, and the proof is very, uh, this part of the proof is very uh, simple, and just uses a lot of the machinery that's set up. Okay, the Euler characteristic is exact, on uh, short exact sequences. That's the main thing, okay? And that's a very, very nice sort of fact. And the rest, well, there's this heavy uh, say duality theorem, which uh, I haven't proved in this playlist uh, uh, that's used. Uh, but other than that, yeah, this part is uh, fairly straightforward. And this is how uh, algebraic geometers, that's the most important theorem that they use to study the Riemann-Roch space.
In the next video, I'll show you how you uh, use the riemann roch theorem uh, to show that elliptic curves are cubic curves. Okay, so it, uh, it's uh, something that you can really use in lots of interesting ways. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.